These iconic words were spoken by astronaut Neil Armstrong on July 20th, 1969, when he and Buzz Aldrin became the first humans to walk on the moon. The Apollo 11 moon landing was the culmination of years of research, technological advancement, experimentation, training, and practice, and it is still regarded as one of the most important events in the history of exploration on our world. But let's turn the clock back 400 or 500 million years and consider some other explorers who took some of the biggest steps in the history of life itself. Of course, I am talking about the plants and animals that took the first steps out of water and onto dry land. I am talking about the organisms that left their aquatic environments and colonized the terrestrial realm or non-marine realm, paving the way for the rest of things to come. It is often said that water is the molecule of life. Literally and figuratively, water is the molecule of life on Earth. On our planet, the fabric of life consists of biomolecules like carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. These biomolecules are the substrate of life. They make up genetic material, cell membranes, and all of the enzymes and energetic resources involved in metabolism and homeostasis. All of these biomolecules consist of carbon atoms along with atoms of hydrogen, oxygen, and various other elements like nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, which are found in relatively low concentrations. Because of the fabric of life largely consists of carbon, we typically say that all known life on Earth is carbon-based. But if we look more carefully between the fabric and among the biomolecules, we find that life largely consists of water, not carbon. This graph illustrates the water content of various organisms on our planet. We humans are 65% water by weight. 65% of our mass consists of water. This number varies from organism to organism, but it is safe to say that virtually all living organisms on our planet are comprised mostly of water even animals that live in the ocean and are surrounded by water. Jellyfish are an astounding 95% water. So quite literally, one could argue that water is the molecule of life on Earth. It serves many biological functions that may make life itself possible. Given that water is one of the defining features of all life on our planet, it is a fair assumption that the origin of life on Earth happened in water. Indeed, water almost certainly drove the formation of the first cell-like structures through its interactions with lipid biomolecules that make up cell membranes. The first cells on Earth probably formed when water caused lipid molecules to self-organize themselves into spheroidal vesicles with bilayered membranes. These membranes separated the fluids and molecules inside the vesicles from the surrounding environment, creating the circumstances necessary for the evolution of homeostasis, 
metabolism, reproduction, and other properties of life. However it happened, the first cells formed and became alive. And over time, through the processes of evolution, they gave rise to all of the diverse life forms alive on our world today. Along the way, they passed their dependence on water onto their descendants, generation after generation, one after the other. And water remained a necessary and critical component to all creatures that evolved on the tree of life. In the beginning, life must have been limited to water. Early organisms could only survive if they were completely surrounded by water. But as life diversified, organisms began to evolve new characters, including adaptations. These adaptations would allow them to venture out of water into new and extreme environments on dry land. The evolutionary process by which aquatic organisms acquire adaptations and colonize dry land is called terrestrialization. Terrestrialization does not eliminate the need for water entirely. There are very few animals on Earth today that can survive in the total absence of water for any amount of time. But evolution does make it possible for organisms to evolve adaptations that enable them to manage their water resources. These adaptations allow them to overcome their own inherent water limitations and requirements. Today, there are very few places on the surface of our world where you can't find life of any kind. Life was incredibly successful at terrestrialization. In order to become terrestrial, organisms generally needed to overcome four main challenges. They needed to avoid desiccation, they needed to find ways of acquiring and moving nutrients. They needed to innovate and find new ways to reproduce. And they needed to evolve mechanical support systems that would allow them to overcome gravity and survive in air as opposed to water. First and foremost, organisms needed to evolve adaptations to avoid desiccation or drying out. Outside of water, moving air and solar radiation cause water to evaporate out of organisms, drying them out and killing them in the process. Some animals like tardigrades, such as this one shown here, have evolved adaptations that allow them to survive total desiccation. Tardigrades, which are also known as water bears or moss piglets, are a phylum of water-dwelling microscopic animals with segmented bodies. They somewhat resemble arthropods, but lack many of their defining features. Tardigrades are very small and have been found in virtually all environments on Earth from the deep sea to the tops of the mountains from tropical environments to freezing Arctic ones, from hot springs to frigid waters and ice. Amazingly, these bizarre little creatures are some of the most resilient animals on our world. They can survive exposure to extreme temperatures and pressures. They can survive in the absence of food, oxygen, and water for extended periods of time. Tardigrades are even able to survive in the vacuum of space. Yes, astronauts have actually taken tardigrades into space, and most of them survived the trip. 
tardigrades are able to survive extreme conditions because they can suspend their metabolism. They can stop consuming food and oxygen and enter a phase of total inactivity. Some desiccated tardigrades, such as this one shown here, have been known to survive for years in the absence of water by suspending their metabolism and becoming inactive. When these tardigrades are returned to water and are hydrated, they become active again. They forage for food and reproduce. It's as if nothing has happened at all. It is important to note, however, that tardigrades are the exception, not the rule. Virtually all organisms die when they are desiccated. For this reason, most plants and animals have evolved adaptations that prevent water loss in the first place. One of the best and most common adaptations for terrestrial life forms are waxy layers, cuticles, and exoskeletons, which are impermeable to water. Land plants, for example, are covered by waxy cuticles made of hydrocarbons and lipids. This outer covering protects a plant from physical damage, but more importantly, it prevents water from evaporating out of the cells located in the interior of the plant. Insects have evolved similar adaptations to their exoskeletons. The exoskeleton of an insect consists of a number of layers. The outermost layer, the epicuticle, is a thin waxy layer made of hydrocarbons, lipoproteins, and fatty acids. Just like the cuticle of a land plant, its function is to prevent the loss of water due to evaporation. Another important challenge for an organism living on dry land is acquiring and moving resources, as well as isolating and secreting waste products. Generally speaking, organisms that live in water have an easier time acquiring resources and distributing those resources across their bodies. This is because most of the nutrients and resources they need are dissolved in the water around them. They can simply absorb whatever they need from the water into their bodies wherever it's needed. They don't need adaptations for acquiring the resources in the first place and then moving them around from one place to another. Things are considerably more complicated for life on land. Consider the case of how plants acquire water. The leaves and stems of a plant generally don't absorb water out of the air. Their water must be acquired from the soil and distributed throughout their leaves and stems. Likewise, Plants must deal with the challenge of distributing the sugars they produce through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis occurs in green leaves, not flowers or roots. But the cells in flowers and roots, nonetheless, do require the glucose produced by photosynthesis in the leaves. So plants must transport the food from one part of their body to another. For these reasons, plants have evolved specialized tubular cells called vascular tissues, which are responsible for moving water and sugar throughout their bodies. Water is absorbed by cells in the roots and then transported by vascular tissue called xylem up to the leaves and flowers. The process is largely controlled by evaporation from the leaves, which creates space at the top of the plant for water to move up the tubular cells of the xylem. Naturally, these challenges are not unique to plants, and animals 
have also needed to evolve many adaptations for acquiring, storing, and moving water in terrestrial environments. A third challenge for terrestrial life is reproduction. And really, there are two issues for organisms that reproduce on land. The first issue deals with fertilization. In order for a male to fertilize a female, the male reproductive cells, the sperm, must be able to locate and travel to the female gamete, or ovum. Of course, sperm are swimming cells, and they require the presence of a fluid, like water, to reach their destination. For organisms surrounded by water, fertilization is very straightforward, as males and females can simply disperse their gametes into the water where the sperm can migrate to the ova. This manner of reproduction is called broadcast spawning. The organisms simply broadcast their gametes into the water. Organisms produce so many reproductive cells that fertilization and reproduction are virtually assured. Coral are a classic example of broadcast spawning. They reproduce once or several times a year. Seasonal changes in water temperature, light, or nutrient availability send a signal to each coral living in an area to release their gametes. The entire process is synced up for the entire population, so all members of that population release their gametes at the same time into the water around them. Fertilization then happens in the water column, where the sperm and ova meet, produce embryos, which grow into larvae that sink to the seafloor, where they settle down, grow and develop, and spend the rest of their lives as sessile coral. Overall, this manner of broadcast spawning works in the ocean because the gametes are released into water, which allow them to move. Many different types of marine animals reproduce in this way. On land, plants and animals, however, require adaptations that help to ensure that male reproductive cells encounter and fertilize female gametes. One adaptation that allows land plants to overcome this challenge is pollen. Pollen consists of grains. Each pollen grain contains moisture along with the reproductive cells which produce sperm. The hard shell of each grain protects the cells inside from desiccation. The shapes of the pollen grains help them to be dispersed by natural processes like water or wind. Pollen can also stick to the bodies of animals called pollinators, which carry and disperse the pollen across terrestrial environments. Insects, birds, and even some mammals can be pollinators. In any case, some pollen grains eventually get dispersed and transported to the female parts of plants called stigma. There, at the stigma, the pollen grains release their sperm, which travel down into the egg and fertilization is able to occur. Land animals, unlike plants, tend to take a more direct approach to reproduction and fertilization. In copulation, the male directly passes its gametes to the female, ensuring the reproductive cells have no trouble finding each other. Nonetheless, the challenge of reproduction doesn't end with fertilization. The embryos and zygotes produced by fertilization still require water in order to survive. 
When fertilization and reproduction takes place entirely within water, desiccation isn't a problem for embryos or zygotes. But the same is not true on land. To protect their offspring from drying out, terrestrial plants and animals have evolved many adaptations for surrounding them with water and protecting them from desiccation. In plants, embryos and zygotes are encased within seeds. Seeds have protective outer coverings that prevent evaporation and loss of water from the offspring. Terrestrial reptiles, likewise, encase their offspring in eggs with hard shells that are impermeable to water. This, of course, is also true for birds. Not only do their eggs prevent water loss, but they also protect offspring from physical harm. However, not all terrestrial animals lay eggs. Unlike reptiles, females of mammal species carry their young with them. Marsupials, for example, carry their young in pouches. In a placental mammal, such as a human, an offspring is carried in the uterus until the child is mature enough for delivery. All the while, the offspring is surrounded by water and protected from the external environment. One final challenge for terrestrial organisms is gravity. Particles of water and air exert pressure on organisms. Think of this pressure as a force that surrounds and squeezes an organism like a can of beans. One part of this crushing force is the downward force of gravity, pulling on the can, forcing it down. However, there is a counter or opposite force called buoyancy. This force pushes upward on the can, keeping it afloat. Overall, the buoyancy of the can depends on its density. If it has a lower density than the fluid, it will float. Conversely, if it is more dense than the fluid around it, then it sinks. Organisms consist mostly of water. This means that organisms that live in the ocean and are surrounded by liquid water tend to be roughly the same density as the fluid that surrounds them. As a result, they tend to be fairly buoyant. The effect of gravity is balanced by buoyancy. Plants and animals on land also consist primarily of water. However, they are surrounded by air, not liquid water. Because water is far more dense than air, the buoyancy force on terrestrial life is negligible. Consequently, gravity tends to pull them down. In order for organisms on Earth to conquer terrestrial environments and grow tall above the surface of our planet, they had to evolve a number of adaptations that would allow them to conquer gravity. In general, adaptations for gravity are characteristics of organisms that provide structural or mechanical support. Think of this problem in terms of construction. If you are trying to build a really tall building, like a skyscraper, you need to use the right materials. Otherwise, the building might collapse under its own weight or tip over in the wind. Steel and concrete, of course, are some of the most common materials for constructing large buildings and skyscrapers. Organisms, however, aren't made of steel and concrete. In order for life to leave the water, it needed to evolve materials that can stand up to the force of gravity. 
land plants evolved from green algae. Take green algae out of the water and it tends to fold, bend, and collapse easily under the influence of gravity. In order for the descendants of these organisms to inhabit terrestrial environments, they needed to evolve materials like wood and bark, which do not bend or fold so easily. The plant cells found in wood and bark are surrounded by thick cell walls containing large amounts of a polymer molecule called lignin. The evolution of this polymer lignin was a key step in the origin of life on land. Lignin is directly responsible for adding rigidity to many tissues of land plants, including wood and bark. If plant cell walls did not contain the polymer lignin, there would be no bark or wood. There would be no tall plants, no forests, or any of the other terrestrial life forms that rely on those things. Suffice it to say that animals also needed to evolve adaptations to deal with gravity. These adaptations included things like solid internal skeletons and tough, rigid exoskeletons that could withstand the bumps and forces of life surrounded by air. In summation, it took many steps for life to move out of water and onto land. Terrestrialization took time. Plants and animals needed to evolve adaptations that prevented desiccation and water loss. They needed to develop new ways of reproducing, as well as new means of acquiring and transporting resources. They also needed to evolve new methods of overcoming gravity itself. Always remember that long before we humans were sending people to the moon, the life on our planet had a long and rich history of creation, innovation, and adaptation. We are hardly the first creatures on Earth to take big, bold steps into new and seemingly very hostile terrains. We come from a very long line of bold explorers.